Hi, and welcome to Newswire LA. I'm your host, Chen thomas Angsi. This week, Newswire LA is the guest on the set of an all-new movie being shot here in the Westchester section of Los Angeles. That movie is entitled The Last Letter. The Last Letter stars Sharon Leal, Omari Hardwick, and Bill T. Cobbs, among others. The creative force behind the film is filmmaker, director, writer, and producer Paul D. Hanna. Paul D. Hanna may not be a household name right now, but he already has five major films under his belt, and he's also being billed as the next Tyler Perry. So we're very lucky that the filmmaker took time between takes to give us a look inside this new film, which is coming very soon. He's also going to give us insight into what it's like being an independent filmmaker in a film company town. So sit back and enjoy, and we're going to catch up with Newswire LA's Jamie Wright after this. Jamie Wright of Newswire Los Angeles, and we are once again in a unique place for a great time. I am on set in the home of Paul D. Hanna. Thank you for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for being here. Paul is an award-winning director, film writer, and producer, and we are on set for his latest film, The Last Letter. He has a unique genre where he focuses on the African-American community with themes that are common to us. Paul, if I could just understand and find out from you, how did you get your start in film? Well, it started in theater, really. Uh, just as a, a young kid, 12 years old, doing acting and then rolling into directing my own plays at 12 with just the kids around the neighborhood and then uh, through elementary school and junior high school. Uh, and then from there, uh, just doing local plays in Seattle, uh, where I went to college. and. Uh, from there, came to LA and started doing my hair as well. There is some comparison between you and Tyler Perry, you being the next Tyler Perry. What would you say distinguishes you from a person like Tyler Perry? Well, I think we're all individuals. I think that the stories that Tyler tells are relative to who he is and what he knows. And I think the stories that I tell are relative to who I am and who I know and who I am and what I know. Uh, I think Tyler is has been amazing in terms of his journey as an entrepreneur and, and a business person. Um, from my perspective, what I want to do is tell stories that are different and come from where I come from, which is, you know, I spent 14 years in corporate America, you know, uh, I've, I've known all different sides of urban America from being impoverished to, you know, owning property, you know, and everything in between. So I think my stories uh, just tend to be different, but I hope to reach that level of success one day. I, absolutely. Yeah. You know, there's probably somebody out there thinking, wow, I'm in corporate America and I want to make the transition because I hate my job. <laughs> Sometimes I think that about being a lawyer, but that's beside the point. How did you make that leap and, and how are you able to be successful in that leap? Well, I think for me, uh, it was about uh, having a groundswell, you know, it, it just starting something that was small uh, and then having success with that. And, uh, you know, corporate America bottomed out, you know, essentially. And at that time, I think everybody was looking for a way to have some more financial security. So for me, uh, when that uh, happened in corporate America, I took that chance to kind of start my own corporation. And from there, just having looked back, been blessed to just keep growing, getting higher, yeah. Okay. So let's talk about growth. I mean, I know you've had the Marriage Chronicles, which I've actually seen. I was watching BT a couple yeah. weeks ago, and I was like, wow, I've never seen this movie, and I watched it, uh, The Redemption Dog, and mm -hmm. now The Last Letter. Mm -hmm. um, 
obviously each of those are three different types of film, but they're mm -hmm. all produced by you. How does the process begin from you writing a script to actually producing a film? Uh, you know, it's about coming from the business world, thinking in terms of budget, what can I do creatively inside of this box? So, you know, you're thinking outside of the box story-wise, but you're also building a box for yourself where you can be successful in telling a story with the kind of budget that you need to uh, in the marketplace. So for me, you know, it starts with an idea. Mm -hmm. And then from an idea, a great storyline, strong characters, and then you start to envision these great actors that can come and bring the story to life. Uh, and then you go and get a great team, you know, and, and for me, um, <clears throat> like on The Last Letter, we're working with uh, Angela White, who's a phenomenal producer, Alicia Washington, uh, and, uh, you know, several other people. So having a great team is also essential because you can't do everything yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, so from conception to delivery, it's about execution. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about execution in terms of how you pick the actors. I mean, you have a phenomenal lineup on this movie. I, I was like, wow. You know, how were you able to, you know, acquire these actors for your film? You know, what was the process and what has the energy been like working with them? Well, when you have, you're blessed to have a great story and they see it's a great story. Actors, particularly in the urban world, that they don't necessarily get to play these type of characters. Mm -hmm. Well-rounded, well-groomed, it's not the same story, something very, very different. Uh, they want to play those those roles. So, you know, having a great story, making the inquiry, and uh, once they see the script, that's usually what seals the deal for me, uh, is they read the script, they love it, and they want to do it. Um, so we've been blessed in that way. But, you know, I think also the opportunity to be creative. You know, Hollywood sometimes sticks you in this box. TV sometimes sticks you in this box. And I try to write things that allow you to be very, very creative in your delivery and your interpretation. Okay. Okay. Well, last letter. Mm -hmm. You know, what is, what is the storyline that is going to just get, you know, the other, per the other people to come and say, wow, I am going to really support this. What is the takeaway? I've never seen a movie like this. Uh, the last letter is about a woman who suffers from a severe sleep disorder. Uh, and this disorder ends up being so severe that um, she struggles with telling the difference between reality and her dreams. Uh, and she unwittingly ends up smothering her child in one of these episodes. So it's about you know, this couple and how they deal with that, obviously. And, you know, being in a situation where you can't control what you're doing. And it's not, you know, this psychosis, it's not, you know, that you're just crazy. You literally have something that debilitates you from being able to um, operate, you know, and in the real world. And so it's this very eerie psychological journey that I just don't think we've, we've seen before. And I'm a big Hitchcock fan. And, you know, it's, it's almost my old to Hitchcock in terms of the suspense and the eeriness and the characters and how they how they act and move and breathe and, and speak. Uh, so I'm extremely excited about this. And I, I guarantee this is something that people have not seen before and they'll leave just amazed. Yeah. And the couple is Sharon Liu, and is it Omari Hardwick, is that correct? correct? Yeah. Now, I've seen both of them in different types of movies. Mm -hmm. And so how has it been um, in their preparation and then watching them on camera playing a couple and then one of them having such a severe sleep disorder and being a supporting husband? Because I've seen him in a thug role. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think they both wanted to play these roles because it was different for them. Okay. Uh, Sharon Lil is amazing. I mean, she's blowing me away with just about every scene that she acts in. And it's just, she has really nailed this character and that emptiness inside and that that uh, that fear. And it's been amazing. Mm -hmm. And Amari has been great as well. I mean, you know, I think people are gonna be shocked seeing him in, you know, this uh, straighter role, you know. Uh, but he's just done an amazing job. The preparation has been great you know he'll come and he'll talk to me about the scene you'll see him go in a corner somewhere and just get there you know and uh, when he gets on screen he's just he's just there he's present he's strong and uh, they have great great chemistry together wonderful chemistry yeah now in terms of the set we're obviously in your home <laughs> what is the energy like 
in your home versus being on a in a studio, I like guess studio lot. Like, how is that? What is that like? Well, I mean, we're shooting here, so you know, there's not much different uh, except dealing with the neighbors, obviously. Right. Uh, but you know, it, it it works the same way, and I, I love shooting in in real locations because it just gives you a sense of of this being a home, it gives you a sense of this being the place that uh, this is really taking place, so. And then sort of, if you could give us a concept of what your plan is for the future in terms of your filmmaking and writing and producing, you know, what where would you like to see yourself go in the next two to three years? Well, I'm absolutely excited about the next two <laughs> or three years. Uh, I, I think, um, you know, we're gonna do more films films that people haven't seen before, uh, stretch the envelope and really take, you know, Overflow Entertainment, my company and One Truth Media to a, a boutique studio level, uh, similar to what Andre Harrell did with Uptown Records. Uh, and uh, from there, we'd love to expand into TV, which is, I, I think, in sorely in need of some diversity in terms of story storyline as well. So those two things will keep me very busy for the next two or three years, I'm sure. Okay. Yeah. And if you could give one piece of advice to someone who maybe wants to make the transition, um, something that you did that you thought was important, what would that be in order to encourage them to make that transition and be successful? Well, it's preparation. It's, it's work. You know, I, I don't think people understand how much work goes into doing this. Um, you know, you're talking about 12, 14 hour days, you know, for weeks on end. And before you even start to shoot, you're talking about two to three months of nothing but work. I mean, all day, every day, all night. I'm exhausted by the, by the time it's time to shoot, you know, because we've been working so hard. So I think Understanding that it takes hard work and making that preparation and that dedication to be prepared uh, and work with diligence, I think, is is what's going to get you there. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, I'm sure you did a lot of preparation on this set, which I think we would like to see mm -hmm. and view mm -hmm. and get some you know, shots for our viewers. Yeah. But in the meantime, I know you need to get back to shooting since we are interrupting your schedule. But thank you for sitting down and taking the time to talk to us. I really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Thank, thank you. you for coming. Thank you. I am with one of the associate producers, Angela, inside of the baby's nursery, which is pivotal to this story because one of the issues is that the wife in this movie has a sleep disorder which causes her to smother her child. So can you tell me a little bit about the concept for how the nursery looks, how much time is being spent in here, just a little bit of background information. Um, today, the production design team, they spent all day working on the nursery. Um, we even have a prop baby that will be used at times so we won't have to torture a real baby. Um, this particular scene here, this nursery is set up so it's kind of close to the actual bedroom of where Catherine and Michael Wright, who's played by Sharon Leal and Amari Harwick, actually stay. Um, at this moment, this baby is about six months old. Okay. Uh, with her sleep disorder, every night she gets up and she starts rocking the baby without realizing she's taking the baby, moving the baby, moving around, mm. um, which is really a common disorder. A lot of people don't know that when people do what they normally do during the day, when they're sleepwalking. Yeah, so if they normally cook food, they'll go outside and not realize that they are actually asleep. So what actually happens in this case, one day she's thinking about killing her baby, mm. but thinks it's a dream. And in reality, she actually kills her baby. So she has visions, she has dreams, and a lot of her dreams come face with reality without telling too much. Okay. But since you already know that the baby actually dies, then yeah. we can tell you that part. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wow. Very moving and powerful. Uh, and again, it's, it's a very common disorder. A lot of people don't realize that. Really? And is that where the concept came from, that there's a, there's a lot of studies out there that that's a prominent issue in communities of color, or is it just... Well, I don't know if it's communities of color, but Paul definitely did um, read about this. He did a lot of study on it, on this disorder, mm -hmm. and I don't think it's just targeted towards people of color. I think it's for everyone. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times people just don't discuss it because it's an embarrassing topic. Absolutely. Uh, we all maybe know somebody who sleepwalks. We might think it's a joke mm -hmm. or we might say, does that really happen? You know what you're doing at night. But no, it's a real disorder where people actually live their lives while they're sleepwalking. Wow. They can actually get on the phone. They can actually talk. They can actually cook. They normally go outside wow. and they can murder. Well, thank you so much, Angela. 
More sneak peeks, everybody. We are behind the scenes in wardrobe with the costume designer, Moon, and Tamia, the stylist. And all I wanted to know, you know, a basic understanding of how does it all begin? How do you pick a black pump versus a red pump, a black blazer versus a gray one? Um, well, sometimes I go by the, um, the story and the feel and the emotion of the character. Okay. So in one will go with their, with their complexion. Okay. But because with TV and film, it's about telling a story through wardrobe, it's the story will guide the choices that I make in creating a world based on what's going on in the world of the character. Okay. So although a red pump may look really nice, but it may not be the best shoe for the emotional state of this person. Okay. So, you know, I'm guided by the character's story. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so here's a question, okay. now that I'm thinking about it. When the main character, who's played by Sharon Lill, who has a sleep disorder, goes to sleep at night, is she sexy playboy maid? Like, is she, you know, grandma long gown? What is, what is the style there? Well, Sharon's character, Kathleen, she has, she has a backstory, mm -hmm. and um, she comes from a world that dictates dictates the world she's in currently, where she's going. Like the like the fashion okay. th that that she chooses, she's the type of person that isn't is unaffected. That's a world that a, wor a word that Sharon gave me. She's unaffected, mm -hmm. so she's not the type of girl that looks through a magazine and says, "Okay, I'm gonna wear this." Mm -hmm. She kind of makes choices based on where she grew up and where she came from. So she'll see something based on the range of what she perceives as something fashionable. Okay. So that's where that comes from. So she, she definitely wouldn't wear the sexy clothes because that's, what, that's not what she thinks about. Okay. You know, some people may look at her clothes and say that they're corny, okay. but in her world, it's really like, this is fabulous. So her gowns are long, like floral prints, something that a person isn't, really spending a lot of time thinking about the clothes more functioning more functional and really like i said based on the world she's come from interesting yeah it's very interesting okay all right well thank you so much for that well, we had one of the most unique opportunities here today at Paul Hanna's house. We were here on set in the middle of filming, got an opportunity to meet his wardrobe people. We just saw Sharon Lil scoot by, and we are looking forward to seeing his movie, The Last Letter. So I ask all of you to stay tuned because we always have something unique for you here at Newswire LA. Thanks. And that was a great report from Newswire LA's Jamie Wright on the set of The Last Letter with Paul D. Hanna. And that's it for this edition of Newswire LA. We thank you for joining us. To follow everything Newswire LA, look us up on Facebook and Twitter at Newswire LA. That's it for all of us here at Newswire LA. We thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Chin thomas Sangsi, saying so long, and we'll see you back here next time. Thank you.